Welcome to Climate Action News one-on-one, -on -one, brought to you by We Don't Have Time. This series focuses on partners and investors supporting We Don't Have Time. My name is Katarina rolf Jansson, and uh, the host, I'm the host of this uh, program. And today we have a guest, his name is Ole Christian Sievelsen, and he is CEO of Desert Control. This is Ole Christian Sievertsen, CEO of climate tech company Desert Control. Global warming causes lands to degrade, deserts to spread, and temperatures to rise in a vicious cycle. This cripples ecosystems crucial for carbon dioxide uptake and keeping nature in balance to support life on Earth. Desert Control's solution is a compound of clay and water that enhances the health of sandy arid soils, reducing salinity and improving absorption and retention of water and nutrients. Restoring unproductive land and making deserts farmable can take 7 to 15 years. Soil treated with desert control solution can be planted within seven hours. Ulle, welcome to the show. Um, more than 20% of the Earth's fertile land is already uh, degraded. And we're looking at maybe that we only have about 60 harvests left globally. Uh, that's a really, really big, uh, big problem. Um, but your company offers a solution. So welcome to the Climate Action News One on One. And of course, I'd like to, to ask you, what is, um, what is your method? Thank you. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to join the show here. So um, our method is uh, basically a process that we have invented that allows us to turn natural clays into a liquid nearly as thin as water. So the reason why soil degrades and deserts keep spreading is very much related to the degrading capability for the soil to retain water and nutrients. So by applying this liquid natural clay to the lands, we restore the soil's capability basically to retain water and nutrients, uh, and thereby we can combat uh, desertification and uh, water scarcity issues, uh, and hopefully be part of the solution to make sure we have more than 60 harvests left in global agriculture. So how did you come up with this method? Well, um, I very often get the question on how a Norwegian company comes up with a solution for this, uh, because there are not too many deserts uh, in Norway, actually, none at all. Um, but uh, uh, the reason why we came up with this solution for Norway is because we have a lot of uh, experience and knowledge from the oil and gas industry where clay and minerals have been used for various purposes uh, in, uh, in that industry for many years. So we had a lot of knowledge about liquefying clay. Um, so basically our um, uh, co-inventor and um, uh, co-founder and inventor, he... Uh, he uh, uh, came across some challenges and problems they were trying to solve in Egypt at uh, some universities there where they were trying to get clay into the ground. Um, and they were struggling quite a lot with that. You can just imagine getting uh, solids uh, and, and clays and sticky things uh, mixed into sandy soils. Um, and desert sand is not an easy thing. So his thinking was, why don't we try to liquefy it just like we've done in the oil and gas industry for years? So that's really how it came about. Uh, and um, as it turned out, uh, the potential for this is a lot bigger than uh, the problem they had in Egypt. Uh, and uh, it was also interesting that the problem in Egypt also came from human intervention of the area. Um, so um, prior to the 1960s, uh, the Nile Delta used to be the most fertile in the entire region. But then they built the Aswan Dam in the mid 60s and slowly but certainly the region started to degrade and uh, deserts started to be more of an encroaching problem. And they linked that to uh, the building of the dam because the river had used to bring huge amounts of uh, clay and silt mineral with it uh, before the dam was built. And after the dam, uh, well, the minerals and the clay stayed behind the dam. And that was what the scientists in Egypt had figured out was the cause of, uh, of, of the degradation. And we have many dam projects all over the world like this, but if you would look at um, in what areas of the world this can be used and also what impact and connections it has with biodiversity and climate change. Yeah, I think uh, the areas where this type of process uh, and technology can be used is quite large. So we are 
uh, targeting primarily sandy soils, desert land, highly degraded soils. And if we look at uh, the world from a perspective of um, desertification, according to the United Nations, more than 110 countries are already exposed to varying degrees of desertification. And we believe that we can have a solid impact in all of these countries. So we are naturally starting in uh, some of the areas where we've been uh, uh, testing out our technology, like the Middle East region. We will uh, move forward to also uh, implement this technology in the west coast of the U.S., uh, uh, California, Nevada, Arizona. We see lots of uh, news uh, these days on uh, water scarcity issues in, uh, in, in these areas. Uh, when it comes to the impact, um, I would say, well, Saving water uh, is, is going to be crucial both to, uh, to global food security I mean, we need to produce more food in the next 40 years than the planet has produced over the last 500 to support a growing population. And the number one limiting factor for increasing agricultural food production is water. So uh, uh, by being able to reduce water consumption from 20 to 50 percent and at the same time increase the agricultural yields, we can be part of the solution for that area. And also when we think about biodiversity, as you mentioned, uh, well, if we think about how much fertile soil we lose to desertification and droughts annually, that's 12 million hectares of fertile soil every year. Now, the biodiversity loss is not only the biodiversity on top of the soil, but is also the biodiversity in the soil. And uh, more than 95% of all living species of uh, biological life actually live inside of our soils. Uh, and if we kind of like make an estimate of, you know, 12 million hectares perishing every year, how much is that in biodiversity? The, in, in, in weight, that would be equal to something like 25 million African elephants lost every year that we can stop by stopping uh, desertification. So that will also have a major impact, of course, to the CO2 balance sheet of our planet um, and restoring the degraded soils that you mentioned in the intro here actually has a potential to offset, yeah, five, five, five to six gigatons per year, actually. This is really it could be a deal breaker, and, and I'm sure it is a deal breaker in many, many of your projects already. But what do you need to make this grow even faster and and and, and uh, have more more implications uh, for, for good? So we are a startup company, although we've spent a long time in R&D, uh, 12 years prior to uh, establishing the company in uh, late 2017. Um, uh, we're still in the startup stages and we are producing uh, at sort of uh, uh, lower production volumes, uh, the liquid natural clay. So we need to uh, continue our uh, focus path to uh, to build uh, more capacity. We're doing that with mobile factories that can easily be distributed around the world. Um, uh, and then we need to uh, uh, evolve our business model over the coming years uh, to be able to scale exponentially through indirect sales networks and partners and having you know, um, uh, strong entrepreneurial uh, the people and passionate people really build a, uh, a business for caring for the local environment and the local soil in countries around the world. So what is your forecast for growth? Well, uh, my forecast for growth is that we are started already in the Middle East. We have a solid base uh, in uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, as our launch pad for the Middle East and North Africa business. We are planning to establish uh, our uh, entity in the West Coast uh, United States uh, um, towards the end of this year to start uh, activities there early next year. Um, and from there on, uh, I mean, 110 countries is the potential. So uh, um, that's our, our, our ambition, really, to make Earth green again by, uh, by getting this technology available and implemented around the world. And will do you get any any funding from from uh, from pub the public sector? Uh, we do um, uh, attract funding from the public sector. Uh, we already have uh, here in Norway Innovation Norway and their environmental technology program as uh, uh, one of the uh, funding sources that we have available. And we've also been uh, encouraged to uh, uh, reach out to a lot of the European Union. Uh, Programs. Uh, there is a lot of focus on uh, 
soil health uh, in uh, the European research programs as well, that I believe is a very good fit for what we do. Excellent. Well, best of luck. And uh, about your, how you, where your power comes from, if you look back at your, your sort of your climate awareness, where does it come from in your engagement in, in climate and biodiversity and the health of the planet and specific, specifically the soil? Well, I've um, spent almost my entire uh, career in the IT industry and the last um, uh, part of my career prior to this in satellite services industry. When you have had the chance to really observe Earth from space, it gives you a different perspective. Um, so just imagine taking some time lapse back a hundred years ago and, and time lapsing this and seeing what is actually happening to this planet. Uh, that really raised my awareness to a level where I was compelled to act and do something different. So um, uh, in um, uh, 2019, I uh, left a uh, very secure and promising corporate career and dived into uh, the crazy world of uh, roller co coaster rides of a startup to be engaged in combating some of the, I think, uh, biggest challenges that are facing humanity. And uh, uh, the soil specifically is, uh, is, 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 really, is really near and dear to, uh, to, uh, to my heart. And the fact that I also found a company founded in my hometown so that I could move back from the U.S. to my hometown, Stavanger, and take the helm of, uh, of this mission. Uh, it was a perfect match. Very inspiring story you tell us here. So, uh, Ulle, you are a partner of uh, We Don't Have Time, and uh, you opened yourself up for climate dialogue on the We Don't Have Time platform. Uh, why did you do this? Well, um, I believe it's a, it's a platform that is uh, that is capable of, uh, of really putting you in contact with uh, with a larger um, number of people out there who really care about our future, who really care about our planet, um, and uh, getting the kind of feedback and sort of direct interaction with such a large community can be of great value when it comes to also how we develop our business and how we stay on track of doing the right things and having the right progress uh, in making an impact uh, in the world. And so far, how has the response been? Well, um, you know, as a, a startup, we are, um, uh, you know, shorthanded in terms of resources to be able to really fully utilize the platform. We're just getting started uh, and uh, we have great expectations ahead. So what do you what do you hope to achieve by, by joining? Well, we don't have time. What, what is your what are your hopes? So, um, you know, we don't have time is uh, something that has kind of a, a double meaning for me. Uh, you know, we don't have time uh, uh, to wait uh, to actually change the climate is one side of, uh, of the equation. But the other side is really, um, um, you know, we live in a world where we don't even have time to think about it. Uh, and I think that is something that uh, this organization can do something about. And the reason why I say that is because it's very, it's very linked also to what we are focused on. We are focused on raising awareness about issues that are out of sight, out of mind, that are therefore uh, uh, not getting the awareness it needs. And people don't have the time or the understanding or the ability to even see that it's happening so to be uh, a part of this organization, to raise the awareness over uh, really, really impactful solutions that may be there just right under our feet is the reason why we're here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Willis Hewesso, for joining us here on Climate Action News One-on-One. -on -one. And best of luck with your fantastic uh, company and your method. And uh, it's very inspiring to, to realize that there, there are solutions to, to solve this immense threat to our to the survival of, of our species. Um, for those of you watching, of course, you can follow Desert Control on, on We Don't Have Time on the platform and the app. And please stay tuned for other uh, episodes of Climate Action News 101 here on We Don't Have Time. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.